Hello there, we are back. So yeah, I hope you have a great lunch. And I hope that, you know, uh, yeah, you're enjoying so far. And actually, I had a lot of food left over from yesterday's cooking show. So that's my lunch. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, when, because you, all, all of you are refreshed, we will have our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Vinicius. Did I pronounce your name correctly? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. It's Vinicius. It changes Vinicius. according to the country. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult for me, like, because, uh, you know, I, 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 I only speak English and Chinese, of course, but uh, yeah. So, um, so you're uh, going to talk about the uh, anti-patterns in Python, which is, yes. uh, yeah, very interesting. So I will let you take us away then. Great. Let me just reset my timer. All right, let's do it. I've been presenting now about Python anti-design patterns specifically what we should not do with our code. For anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Vinicius Gubiani Ferreira. I'm a senior backend developer at Asion Technologies for about three and a half years now. Asion is a serverless and edge computing company dedicated to making the web faster and safer. I recommend you guys check our website after this presentation. Uh, recently, I started working with the quality assurance area for about three months now. I'm also an open source contributor. I work on a daily basis translating the Python documentation for Brazilian Portuguese. And I also love craft beer and riding a shared bike around the park. Both, I believe, are environmentally friendly. So our schedule for today, for this presentation, is pretty simple. It's mostly the motivation for this talk, talk about generic anti-patterns, and then specific Python anti-patterns. So about the motivation, it's mostly to help you guys reach the next level for anybody who is starting with Python or consider themselves intermediate level Python programmers to improve their code, to make it easier to maintain, to refactor, uh, to read and to speed up code reviews. We have several guidelines such as PEP8, PEP20, PyLint, that uh, for some time when we have, for example, an emergency situation, we have to bypass, to ignore, and they don't cover everything that is necessary to have good code. So this presentation is mostly trying to expand beyond just our basic guidelines. So, Think, uh, speaking about generic anti-patterns that apply to any specific language, not just Python. So before anti-patterns, let's quickly recap into patterns themselves. So what exactly is a pattern anyway, or a design pattern? It's mostly a common solution to a recurring problem. It happens at least three times with different teams without any contact at all among them. Ends up being widely adopted can be considered as a convergence in methodology and is also very reliable and effective. The anti-pattern, on the other hand, looks great when we start, until it's not anymore. Uh, when you usually start with an anti-pattern, it all looks like an awesome field filled with beautiful trees and flowers when things suddenly can go wrong very bad, very quickly, like if you're actually in a maze with monsters. And sometimes it often causes more damage than the original problem itself. We started to wonder, maybe we shouldn't have done that after all. <laughs> uh, they usually belong to one of three large categories that, were pro that are proposed by this book which surprisingly was one of the few books I could find regarding anti-patterns. I recommend you guys check it out. It's also on the references or the slides. The categories are development, architecture, and project management. Since we're not gonna be able to cover all of the anti-patterns, the book have lots of them. Uh, I picked just a few of them over here for discussion. And uh, let's start with Bolt Anchor. Bolt Anchor, it's usually a piece of software that serves no purpose at all. I actually knew this anti-pattern and refer to it as zombie code, which is code is actually dead and is not doing nothing except trying to eat your brain out, figuring out what the code does. 
and the, the, the answer is nothing. The book proposes several approaches for correcting those anti-patterns. And uh, for this one, the solution is to get rid of the code as soon as possible. And I know it's actually easier to say than do, but uh, that is a solution. This one, lots of people probably heard about it, is the spaghetti code, which is software that uh, is very untangled with no structure or clarity. And uh, it's hard to work on that. And uh, even on projects where there is a lead developer, a core developer, or a single developer, if that person stays away from the code for some time, for example, go on vacation, then you have a hard time into trying to pick up the flow of the code. And uh, the solution for this one is to refactor, to clean up, to organize it. We also have the God object, which unlike the spaghetti code, does have some structure, but unfortunately it doesn't mean it's a good structure. It's very easy to spot the God object because you can see it from a thousand miles away. Usually it's like a project with a single file or maybe a class with 300, uh, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 lines of code, or a little method that uh, you crafted so carefully, but unfortunately, it now has 300 or 400 lines of code. So the solution for this one is to split it up uh, into less responsibilities that are easier to maintain. And speaking about responsibilities, uh, everybody heard about vendor lock-in. This is a pattern when our code, our solution, our product relies too much on a specific vendor. And for any specific reason, we decide that we don't want to use that vendor anymore. Let's say the company is going out of business or the dollar currency just skyrocket and we don't want to transfer our costs for the clients. Then if you're actually trying to remove that code from the third party and didn't plan accordingly, then we are probably in for one hell of a party. It's going to be awesome. And uh, the solution for this one is usually to place an abstraction layer in front of the third party solution, like an API, for example. Then we only have to care about the interfaces themselves. And we can literally just change the engine under the hood, and that's it. We don't have to care about anything else. We also have cargo code programming which is pretty much like uh, following a solution or a piece of code blindly and not understanding the what does it do or how does it work. Uh, I'll also refer to this one myself as Stack Overflow Programming, which is something like, hey, found an also code on the internet that just solves my problem. How does it work? Don't know, don't care, move along. No, we should not do that. We should actually aim to understand what any code that we're using does. Everybody heard or will heard once about premature optimization. There's a famous quote that say it's the root of all evil. And in fact, 97% of the time we don't have to optimize our code, uh, but we can't pass those 3% where we do have to optimize the code. And the solution for this one is to plan our code, to design, to implement, and after that, profile, benchmark, and load test it then the 3% that have to be optimized will show up. If we optimize uh, prematurely, then we're going to make our codes unnecessarily complicated. We also have magic numbers, which uh, why do we think they are magic? Because they seem totally random. And if we actually change them for any specific reason, since there are no explanation why we picked those numbers, then we're going to have uh too many weird errors and problems so the solution for this one there are two possible solutions either a comment explaining what that number does or better yet just define a constant in a constants.py file and use it where the constant was and finally we have gold plating which is to continue to work on a task beyond the point that it doesn't deliver any visible value to the customer or to the company. And uh, the solution for this one is might be annoying for some is meetings, 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 meetings with your boss, with the product owner, with the client, with your fellow peer developers. 
uh, for some people might be annoying, but uh, turns out during pandemic times, it's actually good to speak to other people every now and then. So we should try that. So moving on to Python specific anti-patterns. There's a book with a very good descriptive name. It's the Little Book of Python Anti-Patterns. It was an awesome work created and published under Creative Commons license by Quantified Code, a German-based startup. Uh, since it uses that license, we can download it and read and distribute it for free. The link's available at the end of this presentation. And just like the other book, it suggests six large categories, which are correctness, talk about, talk about all the things that are should not break our code, maintainability, everything that uh, will give us a hard time to change the code in the future. Readability is all about making the code easier to read and to understand. Performance is everything that will slow us down. Security is all about threats. And finally, migrations is all about upgrading our Python package versions. So again, uh, there's not going to be enough time to discuss all the anti-patterns. So I picked the ones that I thought were most relevant. We were focusing mostly on correctness, maintainability, and readability. Let's start with this one, which uh, is probably the worst anti-pattern I found. There's a specific link dedicated to just this anti-pattern at the end of this presentation, which is to not specify an uh, exception when we are using try except. Uh, I actually knew this one a long time ago as Pokemon catch exception, which is to catch them all. So let's assume it's OK, which is not to call to catch all of the exceptions at once with a single except. And uh, what we should definitely not do is just pass, move along. Like if nothing happened, everything is fine. I just recovered from an exception. No, we should definitely not do that. We should actually log what's going on to help other people understand what's going on. Otherwise, clients might be in trouble and we're not aware about that. And preferably, we should try to catch specific exceptions instead of the generic ones. Ignoring context managers for handling files. Uh, when we're opening files for read and write, we can have any error uh, with our Python code. For this example, I'm forcing a division by zero on purpose, of course. And uh, if we didn't write the data to the files, we might either lose data or even worse, get the file corrupted and we're going to lose all its data. So to solve that, we have context managers, which is the with instruction on the right. And what does it do? Uh, if we have any problem at all, like uh, an error, then the context manager will still call the dunder exit method, which will be responsible for writing to the file, closing it, and free any resources, the memory itself. Uh, one bad anti-pattern is to return more than one variable type. In this example, we are returning none and a string in the same time on the left. Uh, this usually and sometimes give birth to code that is hard to maintain, to test. So a better idea is just to stick with a single variable type and uh, if we can't do that, maybe just raise an exception for the other cases. Accessing protected members from outside the class. Uh, Python is a very permissive language. It allows us to do many, many awesome things. But uh, sometimes a good thumbs up rule is just because we can doesn't mean we should. And in this particular case, we are accessing protected members from outside the class. The correct way, since they are supposed to be protected, is to implement uh, public interfaces like the gather and setter methods. Assigning to Python built-in functions. Uh, this is bad, really, really bad. Why so? First of all, because we're not going to be able to create new lists using the list built-in function from Python. And second, because it hurts our debugging capabilities. I myself use the Python debugger, the PDB. So I stumbled upon code very similar to this, which uh, I couldn't get more lines on top and below the current line. So it was hard to debug. 
And uh, what we should do in these cases is to give more meaningful names that describes our variables or methods. That is the correct approach. Mixing tabs with spaces is an also bad anti-pattern. This is actually very easy to fix with our IDE. So I'm not particularly sure why people most times prefer space, prefer tabs. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe they forget. I don't know. And uh, the reason we should actually use spaces is due to the PEP8 convention that obliges is well, it's not obliged but enforces requests to use spaces. And uh, if you're not actually satisfied by just ah, there's a rule that say I should use spaces, who cares? Uh, there's another good rule to convince you is that developers who use spaces make more money. And if you don't believe me, there's a Stack Overflow survey saying that from about three, four years ago. And uh, this is not fake news. I'm not making that up. The links are on the references. You can check it out at the end. So if you don't want to use spaces, then that's OK. More money for me, for money for everybody else who uses spaces. The bottom line here is that using spaces pays off, literally. So another interesting anti-pattern is to not use else when appropriate with a loop. This is kind of tricky. I myself tend to reject this one a lot because it doesn't seem natural to me that uh, a for loop have else statement, but uh, in Python it does. And uh, if you are also like me, you feel distressed when you see something like this, uh, maybe just stay away from the cold for a while, like five minutes, 10 minutes, go grab some coffee, look out the window. It's probably going to be a beautiful but cold day like today. But uh, when you come back, you'll start to notice that the cold day, hey, it does seem better. You don't have to use an extra variable to check if you found what you are looking for. And uh, the catch over here is that we actually need to use the break statement other else, uh, it will enter the else part of the code. Uh, to not use get to fetch data from a dictionary, Python uses the approach of easier to ask forgiveness than permission instead of the look before you leap, like Java and C. So the, better, the best approach for this scenario is usually to go for the get method because then you don't actually have to check if a key exists or not in the dictionary. Python will automati automatically check that for you. And uh, the default value that is returned it is none. And if you're not actually satisfied by that, you can change the default value. On the right, you can see that it is returning an empty string. Using wildcard imports. So ideally, we should import only what is being used. And I know I said ideally, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, why that? Because among other things, using wildcard imports might make module names to crash from one library for on, on top of another. For example, if we use from iSyncIO imports timeout error, timeout error is a very common and generic name. I think it exists, for example, in the requests library. So it's probably going to get you into trouble into trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, I know I said ideally before, we might be using a lot of modules, methods, and information from a library. If that is the case, we might be able to import, for example, a sub-module instead of the whole module. To use the global statement, uh, this is bad. It's OK uh, if you use it for like maybe a quick script or something like that. But uh, for production code, might not be the best idea ever. Uh, the variables are limited from Python due to the method scope or even the class scope. So the global statement is a bit something like, hey, I have these variables that are, they are not inside my scope, but trust me, they are outside. Just go look for them and it works. But uh, if you have lots of methods changing these variables, especially with something like async IO, then you're probably going to have pro troubles uh, very quickly and very badly, maybe. And uh, 
The solution is usually to encapsulate the variables into classes, that then they are safe. Using single letters to name our variables, once again, this is bad, really, really bad. And uh, for two reasons. First of all, like I mentioned before, in the built-in Python function, it hurts our debugging capabilities. This is actually true code. I stumbled myself onto something very similar to this twice, and I had a hard time into debugging specific methods. So we should actually use better names to improve our names uh, description into our code. After all, everybody have a name. My name is Vinicius. My name is not V. And I'm not going to name my daughter or my son like A or B or Aux or Temp or any, I don't know, letter in the alphabet. So let's invest some time, not waste, invest some time into proper naming our variables because we also going to debug this code in the future, not just only us, but other developers. So let's help everybody out. Comparing things to true the wrong way, uh, the code on the left works, but if you're actually checking for the Boolean type uh, specifically, then we should preferably use the is statement. And uh, uh, the, a better explanation for this one, I have a few slides over here showing up with examples. We can see that one is true is actually false, which is maybe for those who never use the is operator, surprising. One equals equals true is true, just as 1.0 equals equals true. And uh, on the right, I notice about the memory position for uh, all these variables that were used. This is actually a good question for like uh, interviewing processes because in Python, we don't have to deal that much with memory management. So junior and sometimes even midterm developers don't know about the ID method and memory management. So uh, those who never heard about memory management in Python, I recommend you guys read a bit about it to understand how exactly does it work. It's very interesting. Uh, to use type to compare, we should actually use the is instance, preferably. So that is because is instance checks for inheritance. That means a derivative class. Uh, this is also an instance of a base class too. While you type, just uh, check for the specific class. And uh, finally, not using name of tuples whenever it is possible. Uh, yeah, I hope everybody heard about name of tuples at least once. If you don't, then I recommend you guys stop this talk and this presentation right now. Just kidding, please don't. We're almost at the end. And uh, But name and tuples are awesome, and uh, you should check it out. And unfortunately, they are available just from Python 3.64, which is too bad for those who are still with Python 2. And uh, the advantage for them is that uh, when we use uh, indexes such as 0 and 1, uh, too much further in the code, we might have no idea exactly what that means. But when we use the dot operator, like name.first and name.last, then it's very clear and easy to see and to read what exactly the code is doing. So that was about it I had prepared. Here are the references that I mentioned earlier during this presentation. And uh, you don't have to notice them right now. They are available on the slides. They were already uploaded. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy it a lot. Like we say back at Asio, move to the edge. Obrigado, muchas gracias, vielen Danking, arigato. And I'm still working on the Chinese and Russian. I can't pronounce it yet. If you can, please do. If you have any questions at all, feel free to contact me into any of these means or on the platform for the convention. Thank you so much for the EuroPython Society for the opportunity to present again. Yes, uh, xie xie ni is the thank you in Chinese. Um, so um, yeah, there what you is? go. Xie xie ni. Xie ni. Um, uh, xie xie ni. Xie xie. Yeah. Uh, that, xie xie that's in Mandarin. Uh, it's not my mother tongue, so it's 
uh, take it with a grain of salt, people. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It's very impressive. And um, also, thank it's you. fun to uh, know that, you know, we have uh, so much anti-patterns in Python that uh, I've never heard about that and named triple, to be honest. So I have to leave, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So uh, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Yes, there's one. So uh, yeah. is there any linter that check for uh, most or any of these by default? So I'll also put the questions. Uh, let's see. I believe by lint, we probably check for a few of them, like single variables or uh, into single letter variables. Uh, let's see what else. Mm. Maybe going beyond the recommended method length for variable uh, length. That that's a bad thing. That linters they cannot tell us all of these anti patterns. They might catch a few of them, but uh, pretty much just a few of them, unfortunately. Yeah, I think in the worst case, you just have to uh, sometimes, you know, uh, like I, I have a bad practice of like switching off the errors from the linter. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe if you really have to, you may have to do this. But um, yeah, so and then, um, so among all these things that you introduced to us, so if you have to pick one that is uh, most important and then we should really pay attention to, which one would you choose? You mean the anti-patterns, I think? Yeah, the anti-patterns. Uh, I'll probably stick with uh, the variable naming because that uh, that bugs me a lot. It makes me distressed, like making the code harder to read and to, to understand. Uh, it's it's very annoying, at least for me. But uh, a few of them uh, can also be easily avoided. But usually, when you get practice, like the the God object, it's very common for anybody who's starting to make large projects with uh, so many lines of code. And uh, like I mentioned, if you stay away from two months away from your code, you're going to look into that or maybe look into that in the future, like five years from now, and you're going to think, oh, God, this is not good. Who made that crap? It's yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I would be like, who write this line and git blame and see my name? I was like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, nothing good comes from using git blame. It's either no. going to be you or a person who already quit the company. Yeah, so it's uh, <laughs> just, just don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's very, very interesting talk. And then, uh, so if there's no more questions, I think, uh, yeah, I would just uh, let you relax and then uh, maybe we can play some uh, ads <laughs> in between. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. And then if people have questions maybe uh, later, then of course people can find you in the chat and then um, enjoy your Python. And I'll pass also pass it back to Nick to be the section chair as well. So. Mm -hmm.